This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by Cyber Reason. They're coming for it. Your personal data, your intellectual property, your business. Cyber attackers are working to take what belongs to you and holding you to ransom. Defenders don't fear ransomware, they end it. With Cyber Reason, defenders detect and stop ransomware that even others miss every time. A promise backed by a $1 million breach warranty. At Cyber Reason, they don't fear ransomware, they end it. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash ransom. The Sinclair Broadcast Group discloses that it sustained a ransomware attack over the weekend. Twitter kicks out two North Korean catfish deployed in a cyber espionage campaign. Our evil goes offline again, perhaps this time for good. Hacking back, at least insofar as you let the hoods know you can see them. Rick Howard previews the newest season of CSO Perspectives. Johannes Ulrich from Sands on expired domain dumpster diving. And an update on the Missouri disclosure and proposed hacking prosecution. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Monday, October 18th, 2021. The Sinclair Broadcast Group, which operates 185 television stations with 620 channels in 86 U.S. media markets, has disclosed that it determined yesterday that it had been subjected to a ransomware attack. The media company detected what it regarded as a potential security incident on Saturday and is now in the process of recovery. An announcement issued publicly this morning and filed with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission read in part, quote, As the company is in the early stages of its investigation and assessment of the security event, The company cannot determine at this time whether or not such event will have a material impact on its business, operations, or financial results. Much of Sinclair's network shares the same active directory, and the record suggests that this may have been the route through which local stations were affected. Some viewers appear to have noticed that the NFL football games they were expecting to watch yesterday weren't available where or when they expected as Sinclair worked to resolve the ransomware-induced service issues. There's no word yet, CNN reported late this morning, which gang or strain of ransomware was implicated in the incident. The Hollywood Reporter says that some service disruptions have continued into today. New York One reports that the attack involved, as is now routine in such criminal operations, a data breach of thus far unknown scope. That, too, remains under investigation. Sinclair is working with law enforcement and has brought in an outside cybersecurity firm to assist with recovery. Twitter has suspended two accounts established by North Korean operators with the apparent purpose of catfishing security researchers. The record reports that the two accounts are part of an espionage campaign that began last year. A member of Google's threat analysis group says the two accounts are part of a cluster, some of whose members were taken down in August. The Our Evil ransomware gang appears to have again withdrawn from active operations, this time bleeping computer reports, because unknown parties hijacked the Tor sites the gang used for receiving payments and leaking stolen data. The data dump site had been known as the Happy Blog. Our Evil appears to have detected the hijacking yesterday. Security firm Flashpoint posted a description of this latest occultation to its blog this morning, They note that the gang's former spokesman, a known unknown who went by the predictable hacker name Unknown, had private keys for access to the sites and that the unknown hijackers had used Unknown's private keys to take control of them. A different R-Evil representative, hacker name One Day, with a coy zero at the beginning of the word one, announced the hijacking on the Russophone forum XSS, made an ineffectual gesture in the direction of conciliating our evil's criminal affiliates, wished everyone good luck, and signed off. 
Flashpoint see the incident as an unexpected turn in our evil's attempt to reconstitute their operations, as the group had just begun recruiting new affiliates on the RAMP forum and offering unusually high commissions of 90% to attract affiliates. XSS moderators reacted to the incident this morning by closing the thread in which our evil announced their troubles. The moderators also advised XSS users to block our evil accounts. There's some speculation, and we repeat this with caution because it may represent wishful thinking, that law enforcement authorities may in fact be the hijackers, and observers think that this time the gang may be down for the count, although of course it's possible members will resurface in other criminal or privateering organizations. It's interesting that some of the speculation about law enforcement involvement comes from our evil's criminal competitors. Users on XSS were generally incredulous at this new announcement, Flashpoint said, adding, quote, The spokesperson of the Lockbit ransomware gang claimed this new disappearance is proof that the our evil reemergence in September was part of an elaborate FBI plot to catch our evil affiliates. Several threat actors agreed with the Lockbit representative and added that they believe that our evil will reemerge again under a totally new name, leaving behind recent scandals without having to pay out old affiliates. Another threat actor added, paraphrasing Shakespeare, something is rotten in the state of ransomware. Well, we hope so. According to the Wall Street Journal, some security firms see a middle ground in incident response between supine victimhood and aggressive hacking back. Hacking back is also probably illegal, at least under the U.S. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986. The alternative approach involves both information gathering and direct legal menacing confrontation. The journal writes, quote, That often means persuading a hacker to give consent to access the computer or database being used in the suspected cyber attack, for instance, by posing as a customer for stolen data. End quote. The CEO of security firm Redacted, Max Kelly, told the reporters that cyber criminals often operate with an unreflective and unwarranted sense of immunity, the belief that they can't be identified or tracked. Confronting them with knowledge of the tools and infrastructure they used can sometimes be useful in spooking the criminals and scaring them off. Redacted's Kelly explained, quote, As soon as you come and poke at them and they're able to connect that to the activity they're involved with, they disappear. End quote. Missouri Governor Parson still apparently wishes to hold the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and its reporter criminally or at least civilly liable for their discovery of teachers' social security numbers in the HTML of the state's Department of Elementary and Secondary Education teacher credential website. We haven't heard back from either the governor's office or the office of the Cole County prosecutor, but it seems that the governor's position is attracting few adherents— KWOS News Radio interviewed a representative of the conservative and libertarian think tank Americans for Progress, who points out that anyone could have looked up the site and that the information the state posted was publicly available. So again, a state agency published the private information, albeit in all probability unwittingly, and the legal theory under which the journalist might be prosecuted or sued remains unclear. If a government organization wants to encourage responsible disclosure, threatening those who quietly tell you you've got a problem is probably not the way to do it. And now, a word from our sponsor, ExtraHop, stopping advanced threats with network detection and response. Let's face it, cyber attackers have the advantage. ExtraHop is on a mission to help you take it back. Regain the upper hand with security that can't be undermined, outsmarted, or compromised. With complete visibility from ExtraHop, enterprises can detect malicious behavior, hunt advanced threats, and forensically investigate any incident with confidence. When you don't have to choose between protecting your business and moving it forward, that's security uncompromised. See how it works in the full product demo, free online at extrahop.com slash cyber. That's extrahop.com slash cyber. And we thank ExtraHop for sponsoring our show. (laughs) 
And joining me once again is Rick Howard. He is the CyberWire's chief analyst, also our chief security officer. Rick, welcome back. Thank you, sir. So your podcast, CSO Perspectives, which is available on the pro side of the CyberWire, has been on hiatus for a few weeks now. But today, our national nightmare is over and (laughs) season seven... (laughs) <laughs> season seven. You start season seven of CSO Perspectives. So first of all, congratulations on six complete seasons. Hard to believe you, you've uh, that that has happened, right? It's, six it's seasons. Amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so bring us up to date here. What do you have in store for us this week as you launch uh, this next season? Well, that's right, David. And thanks for that. And it's amazing that we've done over sixty episodes so far. You know, just incredible. And mm. for your for your daily listeners who still haven't ponied up for the subscription side, this is a subtle <laughs> reminder, right? Uh, they can get a taste of what the show is about by listening to CSO Perspectives Public. We've released uh, the first two seasons over there, and you can find links to the shows on the CyberWire website and in whatever podcast app you like to use. The downside yeah. to that is that it has commercials. And if you're anything like me, I hate commercials. So the subscription <laughs> gets you not only my podcast commercial-free, but all of the great CyberWire content commercial-free. So that's a great deal. Yeah. Kind of ironic that 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 you just did a commercial for CyberWire Pro complaining about commercials. <laughs> I never thought it. That's really meta, man. That's totally meta. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. So back to the purpose of this, right? For this episode, yeah. okay, of the first one of season seven, uh, we're doing a deep dive on cybersecurity compliance. Mm, okay. So, you know, there's been a long-lasting debate about uh, compliance in the cybersecurity community about whether or not compliance actually improves your cybersecurity posture. Well, you're right about that. That debate's been going on for well over two decades, and most security people don't think that compliance laws improve their individual situations that much. They might concede that at least they prove a minimal baseline for the community, but that's not what we're going to talk about in this episode. Instead... Mm -hmm. We're trying to understand if your organization's compliance strategy is a first principle strategy, you know, on the same level of importance as the other key pillars we've been talking about in this podcast, zero trust, intrusion, kill chain prevention, resilience, and risk forecasting. In other words, what's the probability of material impact to your organization for failure to comply with one of the 50 plus international U.S. federal and individual U.S. state laws on the books right now? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I remember just this past summer, uh, Amazon got hit by a huge fine for failure to comply with GDPR. Yeah, that's right. The European Parliament fined Amazon in July $877 million, and that's the largest GDPR fine to date. The interesting question is whether or not that fine is material to the Amazon business, whose annual revenue is somewhere north of $113 billion. That's billion Mm. with a big capital B. (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, is the fine just the cost of doing business? But more importantly, what are the chances that small, medium, and large sized businesses that are not the size of Amazon will be hit with a compliance fine that will be material? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting stuff for sure. And uh, you can check that out over on CyberWire Pro. It is CSO Perspectives. Rick Howard, thanks for joining us. Thank you, sir. Next week, big changes come to cyber risk quantification. On October 18th, ThreatConnect will release Risk Quantifier 6, which adheres to the FAIR standards and addresses the challenges of FAIR implementation by applying automation to the cyber risk quantification problem. ThreatConnect RQ introduces new scenarios that enable analysts to leverage the FAIR framework in standard and semi-automated manners. Companies can use RQ to work within the FAIR framework as they do today, while also evolving their risk practice using the power of automation. RQ helps companies evolve and better adopt risk quantification across their organization. You can now scale your FAIR risk models to evolve your risk management program by leveraging your financial data and technical environment data using the RQ risk computation engine. The result? Meaningful reports for more informed and data-driven decisions with business stakeholders. Visit the Risk Threat Response Company at ThreatConnect.com to learn more. (music) 
And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Johannes Ulrich. He is the Dean of Research at the Sands Technology Institute and also the host of the ISC Stormcast podcast. Johannes, it's always great to have you back. Um, We want to touch today on a research paper that one of your uh, Sands students uh, had put out recently, and they were talking about uh, expired domain dumpster diving. You've piqued my interest here. What's going on? Yeah, this was a, a pretty interesting paper. And the problem here is uh, really that companies and entities are just registering domains and then sort of forgetting about it. Not sure, Dave, how it's with you, but I know for myself, <laughs> you have this great idea and you say, hey, it's only $10, let's register a domain. Yeah, yeah. sure, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A yeah, million-dollar idea, right? Yeah, million-dollar <laughs> idea. You register a $10 domain and... And then, you know, every year you sort of get the renewal uh, kind of eventually you sort of say, uh, wasn't that great of an idea, let's uh, stop it. So uh, the students of our graduate school, uh, Christopher Weiss, he took a closer look at what are the security implications of this. And what he did is he looked at expired domain, and you can get sort of a daily feed of that. It's about 200,000 great ideas that expire every day. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) And um, there are really sort of two risks here, or or two kinds of risk. First of all, uh, the entity releasing the domain. And uh, we have seen this in the past, for example, uh, where big brand names just outright forgot to renew their domain, and Mm. uh, then someone else picks it up. That's probably the most obvious part of it. But what's actually a little bit more dangerous and more subtle is quite often organizations end up with like these large numbers of domains as part of a merger, for example, and they never really figure out what these domains are really used for. And one way how a domain may be used is just as a name server for another domain. So as soon as you're releasing that domain and then someone else picks it up, they not only now own the domain that you released, they also own the name server record that may still be used by some of the other domains. So now they basically are able to advertise false information uh, for some of the other domains. And uh, this has been an ongoing issue. I believe even one uh, African country-level domain essentially lost access of their country-level domain because someone forgot to renew a domain name that was used as a name server for that country-level domain. So that's wow. the first part. They were really, you by not tracking what you're using domains for, you may release the wrong domain. And then, of course, you know, things like, hey, someone may have still an email address uh, that they were using. Uh, now you can do password reset if you own the domain name and they used an uh, email address with that domain on, on some random website. So that's, that's another risk of this. So what's the solution here? I mean, is it, uh, I suppose some of the registrars have things in place to to keep these domains from just falling into other folks' hands? Well, registrars just want you to renew your domains indefinitely. And that's definitely one solution, of course, that can be a little bit costly. What you really need to know is you need to figure out what of your domains are really used, what they're used for. Don't accumulate domains that you really are never going to use. That's certainly one way of doing that, but... Like we all know, it's a little bit hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other side to this is, if you're not registering a domain that used to be owned by someone else, then you're also exposing yourself to risk because, well, now you are actually receiving uh, traffic that you never really asked for. Mm. Uh, And actually... I believe we talked about this last year in her paper from one of our graduate students about the cyber bunker incident where we actually got hold of some IP address and domains and such that that were associated with a criminal organization. Of course, right. and now we basically got a lot of their uh, email and web traffic and such. You may now end up with someone else's uh, traffic. And actually, just today, I had someone uh, send me an email that they're essentially under denial of service attack because a domain that's no longer being used still resolves to one of their IP addresses and they can't get rid of the traffic. (laughs) So um, it happened to be a popular BitTorrent tracker. And um, so everybody who wants to download that video is now going to this uh, particular university's IP address and Mm. which amounted to pretty much a denial of service uh, to them. Uh, So if you are registering a new domain, uh, double check um, 
and yet there are various tools like archive.org and such. Was this domain used in the past? What was it used for? Anything malicious here? Anything overly popular that you don't really want to be exposed to? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, good advice as always. Johannes Ulrich, thanks for joining us. Cybersecurity is more than just keystrokes and code. It takes Wipro's elite team of cybersecurists. Specialists with more than 25 years of expertise developing award-winning cybersecurity solutions. Wipro does what others only promise. Wipro. Cybersecurity by Cybersecurists. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Don't forget to check out the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast where I contribute to a regular segment called Security. Ha! Huh? I join Jason and Brian on their show for a lively discussion of the latest security news every week. You can find Grumpy Old Geeks where all the fine podcasts are listed. And check out the Recorded Future podcast, which I also host. The subject there is threat intelligence. And every week we talk to interesting people about timely cybersecurity topics. That's at recordedfuture.com slash podcast. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Haru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Security teams rose to the challenge during a time of crisis, helping their organizations during an unprecedented period, shifting to suddenly support an entire remote staff while still keeping data safe, effectively overnight. Now, as organizations gradually and cautiously move out of adapt-or-die mode into the post-pandemic era, we can expect a second phase of digital transformation, resilience building. This presents an opportunity for security teams, an opportunity to reimagine data security. Code 42 believes that organizations should never compromise their speed of innovation or the safety of their data. That's why the Code 42 Insider Risk Management approach fundamentally shifts the data security mindset to focus on results that deliver business value. For resources on insider risk management, visit code42.com slash showme.